And welcome, welcome to Reddit. This is the Reddit Container Bets Secret Stock Room. Are you guys? Oh, oops. Uh, hi. Good day. This is Steve Ferreira, and welcome to Navigate B two B. I had another channel on. I, I apologize. How are you guys doing today? It's such a pr pleasure and honor to talk to you today. You know, I do have the market on my mind, and here today at Navigate B two B, you know, we're really excited about the show. I actually call the show too few answers and i call it margin call but too few is t-e-u-f-e-u -E -E right kind of see what i did there so just like the um there are too many questions about this hot container market really and too few answers to these complex questions that uh, are topics that uh, my clients and my followers are getting bombarded with so while reddit traders point and click from their mom's basements. Navigate B2B breaks it all down for you before the market opens today. Well, actually it's opening right now, but we got the issues that are salient and topical to get into today. And let's make sure that we break it down before the market, the container market issues its own margin call to shippers who haven't hedged their bets. Yeah, that was a pretty good opening. I'm really proud of myself the way that that came together. Welcome to Reddit Container. <laughs> anyway, uh, having fun with the volatility of the stock market. But I'll tell you, if those Reddit guys ever, ever, ever knew the underpinnings of the container market and the effect worldwide on beneficial cargo owners and shippers and brick and mortar retailers and e-commerce guys, you know, we'd have chaos. I say chaos in the stock market, but Navigate B2B is here to solve that for you today. So no Reddit traders, nobody in mom's basement. <laughs> Although that was me a, long, a, lot, a lot of years ago, there might've been me in, in the mom's basement. Um, so it is really great to be here. And again, I'm Steve Ferreira, CEO of Ocean Audit. I'm privileged to um, host Navigate B2B, thanks to Freightways for having me. And what a great honor to um, have a solo show today. You know, usually I'm talking to world acclaimed uh, guests like the CEO of uh, FedEx or, you know, uh, movers and shakers in the technology world and freight for forwarding world. But today it's just me, Steve Ferreira. So I'm CEO of Ocean Audit, a ocean freight overspend recovery consultancy. And, uh, that is an oxymoron, right? I mean, considering what's happened today with the Wall Street-esque hedge-like uh, pace of this market, uh, a market unlike any I've seen since 1982 when I graduated from uh, Providence College in uh, Rhode Island and started right in the container shipping industry. So I'm one of those guys out there that has one of those 30 plus year stripes. And I wear it well. I love the trade, I love the industry. And um, you know, one of the things we, one of the things that we're going to get into a little bit today in today's show is uh, just how much the industry is shaken out. Um, I know you're going to say because of COVID, but I'm talking about the fact that Navigate B2B is not just about containers and it's not just about ocean freight, but it's also a, a way of life in business, you know, navigating the B2B environment. And we cover topics like LinkedIn and sales marketing and role playing and, and you know, you know, role playing, meaning like sales and role playing, um, and all that stuff is really cool. And it's stuff that doesn't get a lot of a lot of treatment, right? In the uh, uh, in the industry, you know, rags, so to speak, right? I mean, I grew up when we had you know no computers, and you know, it was telex machines and newspapers that were giving us the news. So it's really great to be able to um, share with you the and dimensionalize, you know, some of the content that we want to bring you, uh, share with you today. So um, now without further ado, let me, let me um, set the stage for today's show uh, and give you a little bit of highlights of things coming up. So coming up uh, later in um, the end of February and beginning of March, we'll have uh, Global Supply Chain Week at Freight Waves. And I'll be a big component of uh, part of that where we have the kind of the Maritime Symposium or Maritime Congress uh, portion of the Global Supply Chain Week, and we're uh, scheduling that right now for March 1, 3, and um, one of the things that 
you know, I can't, I can't give you the full um, digest of, of what I want to tell you today. I thought I could, but not quite ready to tell you. But I will tell you that as part of the World uh, Maritime or the Ocean Freight Congress or the Global Supply Chain Week, you know, it's always been my vision to have a free, you know, 10,000 virtual seat conference. And um, Freightways had already had a uh, global supply chain uh, in, uh, week in the works. And if we can um, fit in a couple of days or uh, some, some content on ocean, container shipping industry, it's going to be fantastic. And we've got some great guests and speakers that are lined up for that. So really excited to, to bring that to you. Uh, you can sign up on uh, FreightWaves.com. Just look for Global Supply Chain Week and uh, registration, I believe, is open. Um, and, and, you know, I, I wouldn't have thought... Uh, I've been able to make it out of my my mom's basement <laughs> into where I am now. You know, it's been a wild uh, career for me, just uh, the, the career of dreams, right? I mean, I've I've uh, been privileged to uh, work for some of the largest uh, container shipping companies, and I've worked in uh, exotic locations in Hong Kong and Taiwan and, and Paris and, and Prague, and it's just been amazing industry to me, um, and culmination effect of some of those uh, dreams is going to be coming in that global supply chain week. Um, I have my dream interview uh, coming up during global supply chain week. Um, and it's going to be with one of the most sought after cele celebrities on the planet that will sit down with me one-on-one uh, -on -one and we'll talk about a whole host of issues. And uh, I'll be ready to release that name soon, but I just want to give you a little bit of uh, uh, crescendo in terms of heading into um, supply chain week that uh, I've made it to the point where that uh, celeb will sit down with me, Steve Ferreira. <laughs> well, where are we now? Welcome to the Reddit trading room. No, uh, so that celeb, that celeb will sit down with me and uh, we'll, we'll really have a great one-on-one. Um, -on -one. Uh, I've got uh, uh, I've got a great admin um, that's uh, helping me. We're researching everything we can on the right questions and uh, approaching it with all the, the seriousness. So we want to bring you guys the best content and I need to be on my A game, uh, not only for that interview, but all the great interviews and fireside chats that will be coming to you um, during supply chain week. And uh, that's again on the Freight Waves website. Let's move in and talk about something that is interesting to me. I, I did see it on LinkedIn, so it's not my original thought, but it's something that's been lurking in the back of my head. I think with the pandemic, you know, the issue is on Zoom etiquette, right? Now we're talking about navigating B2B. I'm your host, Steve Ferreira, and Zoom and Zoom and Teams and WebEx are all these great things that we have available to us for um, you know, teleconferencing. But Zoom etiquette has slipped a little bit. It's my professional opinion. Um, people are getting a little bit more hinky about uh, turning cameras on. You know, there's the eating and, you know, kind of the multitasking going on. So I don't know if you guys have noticed that Zoom etiquette is, has slipped a beat a little bit or missed a little bit of a beat there and whether we just kind of zoomed out on it. These are some of the things that I just want to uh, ask the audience and, you know, get your comments on when, you, you know, we communicate through LinkedIn or through messaging. The other thing I want to talk about is, you know, I'm a big uh, fan of LinkedIn, right? That's really my prime go to media channel. And, um, you know, LinkedIn advertising is interesting, you know, it, uh, it's a hell of a drug. I mean, uh, LinkedIn advertising is very different from Facebook or Instagram advertising. Not that I would know because I'm not on those platforms. But LinkedIn advertising, I mean, even a small business like Ocean Audit, you know, can cost you three, four, five thousand dollars a month. But uh, knock on wood, and thanks to uh, you know working with great uh, people that to have that uh, LinkedIn knowledge on marketing and advertising and, and product placement or advertisement design, um, you know, I, I've ended up with uh, some great new clients. Uh, never would have thought that advertising works. I also want to talk about the fact that um, this is really the first public announcement I've made of this. Um, I was uh, last year signed uh, with a major publisher. I have uh, two books coming out, the first in uh, April. Uh, it's an anthology uh, in tandem with uh, some other authors, and uh, one of the ones being uh, Po Chung, the co-founder of DHL. 
And the book is called um, Quitless, The Power of Persistence. And we're really aiming for really uh, great things in that book. Um, my solo book uh, coming out in August or July is called Navigating B2B, Master Your Business, Your Industry, and Yourself. And again, um, it's been the culmination of uh, a long, hard road towards uh, getting those books uh, completed. Um, both books stand on their own merits. And again, we're, we're believing that they're going to be chart busters in terms of uh, the receptivity to the market. Um, so, you know, one other thing too, right? It's, it's not always um, all containers here on Navigate B2B. It's all about business and topics. And my favorite topic is sales. So, um, and by the way, you're watching Navigate B2B. I'm your host, Steve Ferreira, CEO of Ocean Audit in Hartford, Connecticut. So um, when we talk about navigating B2B, you know, it, it's about um, things like uh, role play, right? And role play and uh, getting client proposals uh, right now is a hot topic. And it's because many logistics and directors and managers uh, in that logistics supply chain role have changed roles uh, just like that. And we want to talk about that a little bit later on in the show if we have time. But there's been so many changes in personnel that one of the stock answers that you get when you call, if you're a salesperson in any industry uh, to a client, what's the most common thing they say? Oh, send a proposal. Okay, John, I'll send the proposal over. And, uh, you know, John di disappears into the, uh, into the ether now, into the ether, right? The space is gone and you've lost the timing and good chance that connection is not gonna be made for another couple of weeks. And then there's another delay and delay and delay. So I'm gonna do a, a TV first. This has never been done on live TV. So it worked well in rehearsal, but <laughs> let's see how it goes. So I'm gonna role play with myself. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be the salesperson and I'm gonna be the prospect, right? And we're gonna talk about um, getting a proposal, the whole issue of proposal. So um, I'm gonna be Steve, uh, the, the salesperson or the owner of Ocean Audit, I guess. And the client will just be the client. I won't say his name. Um, so let's start it off. The client will start out the role play. Um, so Steve, I really like what you uh, had to say today. Thanks for your time in the call. Um, can you send me over a proposal? Uh, sure, Mr. Customer. Um, I, I'd, I'd love to send you a proposal. Um, but uh, let me ask you a question. Uh, what would you like to see in the proposal? Um, well, Steve, you know, you talked about the audits and, you know, how much we can uh, receive and the timing, how long it will take. So I guess stuff like that. Oh, OK. Uh, I can definitely do that. I, I understand you want to know about the timing, the fee structure, how long it will take. Um, hey, you know, let me ask you another question. Would it be crazy if I asked you if um, others in the organization would have some stakeholder, um, uh, you know, uh, skin in the game? on this particular uh, endeavor. Oh yeah, um, my, my direct boss and probably my finance manager, maybe even our CFO would probably get, you know, need to get involved. Oh really, Mr. Customer, that's cool. Um, you know, I, I was just thinking, just so that we can economize our time, do you think it would be a great idea to, or am I uh, pie in the sky if you'd go back to those guys and, and you know, float the concept of what it is that you know, we talked about and kind of gauge their interest. And that way I can really help uh, tailor the proposal to all three needs. Would that make sense? Oh yeah, sure, Steve, that's great. You know, I'll, I'll go back and I'll talk to them. Oh, okay. And uh, oh, by the way, Mr. Customer, um, assuming that uh, they're all on board, when we finish the proposal, we have the green light in terms of uh, will you be ready to make a commitment within a few days time? Yes, yeah, Steve, I think as soon as we have that and everyone's on board, as you said, we'll be ready to go. So there you have it. I mean, it, it, it's kind of rough, right? But I um, actually, I came out pretty damn good. Um, I like the idea of being able to rebut a proposal. You know, just don't send a proposal, right? You'll never hear from him. Get get more um, skin in the game and, and increase your A game. So um, let's shift. I think this is a good time to uh, now move over to container stuff. Let's shift to my market musings and update here on Navigate B2B. So will we get a stock markets version of a margin call in container shipping or what's the deal here? You know, right now, carry a quarter three results look good. 
But the reality is, is that I'm still seeing clients, legacy clients with old contracts that are still getting 15, 17, 1800, $1,600 rates to the West Coast. Have had Lloyd results, you know, reflected that a lot of legacy, legacy contracts have been carried over at the old rates. So while the rates and the, the quarter results for Maersk and Hapag were good, you know, they weren't like, you know, explosive. But Q4 will be off the charts because more time will accrue where some of the more spot rates and um, surcharges will come into play. And those will window dress and accentuate uh, the next uh, series of results. I think one of the biggest things that you have as a takeaway, if you didn't take anything away from my humor today, is uh, on the Reddit uh, container market here in mom's basement, is that we're going to have what we call operational oriented, operationally oriented blank sailings in February, which is going to be um, a killer to continue this container getting. Well, let me explain. So operational blank sailings, right now, the schedules are just so screwed up. And, and the Trans-Pacific and carriers need a time to pause. And a lot of times Chinese New Year is the time where they try to refresh and pause. Now, that's not really happening during Chinese New Year uh, as, as you know some factories will still remain open and cargo will continue to flow. But at some point we're going to see the return of blank sailings. I think some 20 blank sailings for uh, February have already been announced. And that's going to obviously constrain space and perhaps even ramp up the uh, inde indexes, indices in terms of what the, uh, the average rates are and maybe even put more pressure on surcharges. So blank sailings are coming back and uh, they will wreak havoc. Now, um, the, re the reality uh, is, is that the reliability and getting rolled, it's almost like, you know, you're paying 5,000 and you've got a, probably a 50-50 chance that your cargo is going to be delayed and your cargo is not going to arrive on time. So carriers you know, are thinking, well, we need to somehow get our reliability back. And it's also a ploy that they do because when they come in time now to do the bids for next this coming season, you know, they don't want to put a chart on, you know, similar to, you know, Sir and Sco at, at Merck put out a chart a few years ago that said um, their error rates on invoicing were 13%. And that was five years ago. And he's never lived that down, right? Because you know, that was a really blunt admission. I'm glad he did it because it was great for my business. But when carriers go out now and say, you know, our on-time efficiency or our, our on-time arrival is 20% accurate, that's really bogus and no one likes that. So I'm not sure whether that puts us into a, a, a container bu a bubble, you know, uh, uh, Wall Street's very volatile, but also uh, this uh, blank sailing combined with uh, viruses in, um, uh, both in Asia and the U.S., right? The port COVID labor is a wild card. Shipper musical chairs, I've never seen, never seen the amount of changes in logistics and direct, uh, directors and managers. We're seeing completely new, we're almost seeing a whitewashing of many professionals moving into new roles. And so, you know, these professional men and women are coming from maybe different parts of the organization, but they're jumping into a hornet's nest. Um, and the issue is, Maybe that's the way it's going to be because in an e-commerce model, reliability is maybe not as important in a, as in a brick and mortar where, you know, the, the right stock, the right model number, the right SKU has to be in the store on a certain date. If you do your inventory planning right out of Asia, maybe that's not so important. So maybe we're starting to see a real paradigm shift and that's breaking news here on Navigate B2B. And I think that as we head into uh, negotiations, you know, small client strategy, Maersk has proven with their end-to-end -end services that the way to get profits is to continue to uh, milk and saturate, you know, all ends of the spectrum. But it's the small to medium-sized clients that have um, the biggest profitability and potential for, for the vendors. Let's move in uh, quickly to um, what's happening in Chinese New Year and give you some update on cargo flow. You know, one of the things that's really interesting is um, December 1, 2019 to January 20, there were 742,000 TEUs out of China. Uh, December 1, 2020 to January 1, 2021, a million, right? So this is one of the reasons why you have those 20 to 40, 20 to 30 ocean vessels um, 
uh, backlogged, you know, in the, in the ports of uh, LA and Long Beach. And that's why one of the reasons you see um, express vessels, like who the hell, who the heck wants to be on an express vessel if, uh, you know, you're waiting seven days uh, out of the 14 days to get, you know, 12 days from Shanghai to LA and then add another seven days on, right? It's no good. So some of these vessels are being diverted up to uh, Oakland and uh, other places, Seattle, to try to uh, alleviate some of the congestion in LA. So LA is really still the bottleneck. And um, I think, you know, I didn't have it down in my show notes, but I think one of the solutions for LA, I mean, if I'm an importer, uh, it might be too late, right? But I'm really gonna go for a transload. I'm gonna go into the West Coast. I'm gonna transload the heck out of my units, my, my containers. I'm going to get my own trucking. Uh, I'm going to not worry about chassis because it, the more you can avoid those bottlenecks of labor, chassis, waiting time, intermodal rail, they all suck, right? They're really a uh, slippery slope right now. And you guys don't want to get too involved in that. So um, the other thing I want to talk about going back to my Chinese New Year chart is, uh, you know, if you focus in on Amazon, Logistics, which is Amazon's NVO division uh, for small, uh, for their uh, fulfillment by Amazon. You see they jumped from uh, 4,000 FEU to 10,000 FEU um, in that 12.1 uh, to 128 uh, period versus the same period um, this past cycle. So one year ago versus, you know, this year. So again, you look at the product mix, it's not really PPE or it's not really, you know, anything related to COVID, but it's more, you know, TV mounts and, uh, you know, uh, you know, robotic vacuums. And, you know, it's anything to beautify the home or to have that feel good feeling. Right. And, you know, with stimulus and the e-commerce models um, that I talked about earlier in the show, it's almost a surefire bet that what we've done is we've actually and, and with this kind of time out. Chinese New Year, right, where we're shut down um, in some ways for 30, 35, 40 days, but cargo still backlogs. So we'll see, we'll see a little bit of a blip, but I don't really anticipate, you know, a huge drop, drop down. So we may have just extended container getting uh, several more months because of the issues that I pointed out in my uh, bullet strategy. And if we have some issues with a new strain of COVID, you know, God forbid, um, it could really play havoc with uh, with labor. Merck came out the other day and put out a, a bulletin that labor is an issue to be uh, uh, aware of um, at all ports because of the uh, the contagion uh, of the COVID effect. So I think we have to really be careful on that. Um, I think that one of the things that we t we started talking about in the show on uh, profits and margin calls is I've really gotten deep down into the container market. And I think when we talk about profits, profits, there's, a, there's even more profits. And I wanted to show you guys, because this is something that really doesn't get uh, talked about much. Now, there are a lot of factors here um, that I didn't uh, take in consideration. But what you're looking at is the revenue for a um, 20,000 TEU ship uh, on a round trip that's both in from Asia and back to Asia. And also the expenses related to that ship, um, fuel, crew, uh, port costs, right? So one of the ways you can kind of measure that is uh, now there are many different models. I don't want, you know, uh, Lars Jensen or Peter Sands from BIMCO, you know, sending me email that my model was wrong because there are other factors in these models. But uh, basically, uh, this is not profitability, right? This is just showing you that in a single trip, right? You, you know, you have a round trip both from Asia and back to Asia. That vessel probably can earn revenue in 50 million and probably has an expense about nine to eight to 10 million, depending on. And if that turns five times a year, if you think about, you know, 30 days in, 30 days out, you know, how many, how many turns can that make? Five, six, I use five conservatively. So, you know, that single vessel, that single uh, 20,000 TEU vessel can book 250 million in, in revenue uh, with about 45 million in, in just general expenses for the vessel. So I think, and then of course, you know, you have labor and you have port side costs and you have intermodal costs. And so I, I think when Maersk's um, financials came out uh, two or three years ago, you know, they really didn't make that much profit per TEU. Uh, but that's not the point of this. The point of this is that um, the raw numbers of where the ocean rates have gone 
you know, and I used an assumption of four thousand dollars, you know, in my model uh, in this uh, particular um, um, ship chartering um, exercise, right? So, you know, some people are saying, well, okay, Asia to Europe, you know, it's in the eight to nine thousand range, um, and, and again, I don't think these high rates will sustain. I mean, I see, in my humble opinion, West Coast rates for um, 2021, April, May, I think you'll see a jump from, say, the legacy contracts of, you know, 14 or 1500, you know, maybe up to 26, 2700. That's my professional guess based now on the tea leaves that I'm seeing and reading. And, And of course, I think the biggest change will be the navigation of uh, inland cargo movements. I think that we have gotten too much into the past on where we could rely on the legacy rail and chassis combinations. I think that right now, um, you know, we have to be our own Reddit stock room, so to speak, when it comes to a solution. And I think we have to band together and. You know, I can see, I can envision some kind of uh, commission or, or a council where, you know, five of the top retailers get together and, you know, I don't know, buy a transloading operation, you know, where people take things into their own hands. You know, could this ever be the time where, you know, a mega retailer would charter their own vessel, you know, and be able to um, make the the profits and get the containers. Could they buy and purchase their own containers? That's possible, right? The market has all types of uh, uh, avenues available for navigating the B2B spectrum. And we've only begun to scratch the surface, just like my role play before. You know, that was something out of the box. It's new thinking. And we need that. And maybe one of the reasons why we have so many new people coming in is that CEOs and CFOs have seen that the new blood the new way of thinking is going to help them to navigate their own B2B uh, journey and, uh, and to make it a profitable one because it's really a brave new world. And, you know, from wearing N95 masks every day, which I think is just, you know, the most important thing, but also one of the most surreal things. And I have to remind myself, you know, this is America, right? And, you know, we love our country and we're patriots and we love everything about business and we're here and we're promoting and we're succeeding or entrepreneurs, we want to grow. And the ability to do that, you know, in a market is it's a brave world, right? We're just creating new things on the fly. And I look to five, six, seven, ten of my close friends and other leaders that are taking strong positions on growing and developing and helping their clients. And we have to do it as a community. And so You know, you've um, been a great audience today to listen to me muse about these topics. I'm always here ready to help you. You can reach out to me on LinkedIn, Steve Ferreira or um, OceanAudit.com. It's just always a pleasure to uh, talk to my audience. I'll have more information for you soon on the the world-class celebrity I'll be interviewing for Global Supply Chain Week. I'll keep you posted. Uh, I should have maybe even some updates, special bulletins uh, to announce next week on certain matters in the container space. And I'm just privileged that uh, I've been able to uh, work out and reach out to other leaders around the world in the sea level space and down at the logistics level, which I, you know, is my, they're my brothers and sisters. Uh, I grew up talking to the logistics managers and this show is dedicated to you and all of those in your new careers. I wish you well and continue to be your support person. So from Navigate B2B, it is just, you know, it's heart filled to be able to reach out to you. And we need to uh, work together. We need seminars. We need proposals. We need leadership. We need training. We need navigating. And I love you all. And I just want to say thank you for watching my show. And we'll be in touch soon. You've been watching Steve Ferreira, Navigate B2B. I'm CEO of Ocean Audit. Thank you so much for the time today. Good day.